giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. We're here in Dallas, Texas uh, at Rev's World Headquarters. I'm going to go ahead and do a really quick build through with our FTC Starter Kit V3. Uh, we kind of already taken a selection of parts here so that we're able to get through this relatively quickly. Uh, but we have a new channel based drivetrain system that we are really excited about and think that it's going to be something that's going to help a lot of teams, especially those that are in like their first or second year, get up and running and have the customization and flexibility that they, uh, that they want. So um, to kind of get started, with this, a lot of it is we need to start with our drive shaft. So we're gonna be running a differential drive, a six wheel differential drive. Um, so we have uh, have some of our some of our 90 millimeter uh, hex shafts here. So we're just gonna go ahead and dive in and get started. Um, so a lot of our uh, build guides, what we try our best to do is make them as kind of straightforward as possible. Um, and we're moving to more and more of where everything is image based. Um, so you're actually able to find that on our tech resources pages uh, on rubberrobotics.com. Uh, and so we're going to kind of be walking through that as well to kind of build this. But the first thing that we kind of want to do is build our single sprocket drive shaft uh, that's going to be running one of our grip wheels. So you kind of start off by using a uh, shaft collar here as kind of a placeholder to be able to kind of build off of. Um, one of the things that we've been finding is that a lot of, uh, a lot of students, it, it's assembly is sometimes a very, very difficult thing to kind of, to kind of do, especially on guides where you don't, where you weren't the one that did the design. So being able to have some really easy, uh, quick and easy ways of being able to have reference points to be able to assemble things is uh, big, a big uh, highlight. So we're gonna start here with, uh, with this put a shaft collar on the end of it and then we're able to start with doing our kind of our stack here so we need to get our uh, through bore bearing our, our shorter versions of these we're going to use the longer ones a little bit later um, but the short ones work really really well inside of the channel so there's the nine millimeter bearing seat that is happens about every six it happens every 16 millimeters down uh, down the channel itself so you kind of start with one of these and we're going to get that uh, put on our hex shaft and these bearings fit on the shaft nice and snug. Um, and then after that, we end up putting on a, a little bit of a three millimeter spacer for some standoff. Um, since this is a chain drive, um, we're gonna be using our sprockets. One of the nice things about a lot of our motion components, whether they're sprockets, uh, gears, uh, or our pulleys, is if they're made out of, if they're made out of a Delrin, uh, out, of our, out of our Delrin variety, um, they are nominally 15 millimeters uh, wide. So you're able to kind of swap them in and out with other ones. Um, and it also makes it really easy for you to be able to swap it for another spacer in this type of a setup. So since we're doing the single sprocket, we set up the single sprocket and then we find our 15 millimeter long uh, spacers there to be able to take up that next spot. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the questions that we actually get often, and this was something that Tyler and I were talking a little bit about uh, before the show was, um, you know, ways that teams have kind of traditionally have built drive trains and other things and uh what are the main uh things that we kind of see in our area and one of the things that kind of made us want to start using the channel and building a channel was we were seeing a lot of robots that had a channel base that then had rev kind of built on top or an extrusion system that was built on top uh, whether it was like masumi or something along those lines and so we wanted to try to find a way that was made it a little bit easier uh, which kind of is where the rev channel itself was kind of born from. Um, so anyway, after we get this uh, 15 millimeter spacer on the shaft, we're going to add that three millimeter spacer uh, and then our other short through bore bearing. Um, but one of the things that I, I, I find kind of also interesting is just the different types of drive trains that you're find at events. So you'll, especially newer teams tend to use like a differential drive or a tank drive. Uh, Mechanum seems to be a very, very popular choice with an FTC. I know that there's some friends that are differential swerve uh, folks that want to try to do that. Um, but there's a, there's a number of different options. So like if, if anybody has some suggestions on potentially some upgrades that we can do to this, if they have any questions about ways that you're able to transition the system, please feel free to ask them in the chat. We have a few of our uh, staff are there. Tyler's also monitoring the chat to kind of help us uh, answer some questions as we're going along. But anyway, once we kind of get this spacer stack, um, and the sprocket stack here done. 
uh, this single sprocket assembly is complete. Now for a normal setup for any of these sprocket assemblies, you're gonna actually need two of them. Um, however, we're gonna do this a little bit like a cooking show. We already have one of those in the oven um, that is gonna be able to, we can kind of pull out later, later to be able to do the full uh, assembly. But since that one's done, we're gonna go ahead and move over to our double sprocket. Again, it starts in a really, really similar way. We like using shaft collars or some other thing as a as kind of a hard stop. So you just align that up with the end and cinch that down. You're going to start again with your through bore bearing, the short variety, and continue to kind of move from there. So, Mike, we had a comment in chat uh, just uh, talking about the shaft collar set. Somebody calls them uh, top hats. Do you guys at Rev have any uh, nicknames for some of your parts or even the shaft collars? Uh, yeah, actually. So the, the most actually interesting thing is the, is, is when products are um, about to be named or like we're actually about to launch them. So they'll have internal names and then sometimes those happen to stick along and you'll see them in, in, in other areas. Um, one of our internally favorite ones was for the longest time we had, uh, Mechanum, uh, someone put into search, uh, Mexicanum, which then made into a meme internally within our office. Um, so you had Mexicanum drivetrain. So you had a Mechanum with uh, churros from, I think, like Taco Bell were like wrapped around it in a very, very poor Photoshop. Um, I don't remember who exactly did it, but uh, that one that one is personally kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, but yeah, so there, there are a few of those types of options that are that are around. Um, so anyway, so we get the, we get the short through bore bearing on here. And I'm actually noticing a mistake that I actually made. And you might not be able to see this unless you're in this. Uh, close in view here um, and it is the uh, you can kind of see this the orientation of this bearing where this is the bear this is where the bearing sits on the nine millimeter end the bearing location actually matters so when this actually gets installed into the channel the channel is going to be sitting here and so there's going to be nothing that's going to be running in that nine millimeter od um, the the hole for the bearing seat so you need to make sure that this is put in the right the right way and so since I noticed that I did that wrong, what we're going to do is we're going to do this the easy way. And we're just going to flip it over to the other side and connect this down in here. But that's a that's a very, very kind of there's a lot of these like little like kind of little things. If you're not um, we, we have a call outs for it in the assembly guides, but there are some of these things where especially if you have um, students on your team, right, you have like a design lead or a building lead. You know, and then you hand it over to you know a new student that's available on the team, and they go ahead and they build the thing for the first time. Um, sometimes they can run into some mistakes, and if you're not really clear on how you want things assembled, uh, sometimes you'll be surprised on what you end up getting back. Um, so with this one, it starts pretty much the same way as the single sprocket, but instead of putting that other 15 millimeter space around there, we're going to put another sprocket on there. One of the cool features that I actually like about all of our Delrin. Uh, products is we actually have this this notch feature which I, I don't know if you're actually able to see this um, completely on the uh, on the stream video but basically it's an alignment notch that then you know that all the sprockets on your shaft are aligned the same way it makes it kind of easier especially in situations when you're running two of the same sprockets up to or you're running doubling up on sprockets to run up to like an arm um, within the drivetrain though it's kind of nice because it makes it a little bit easier to seat the chain a little bit later in the build. Uh, so anyway, that's another kind of nifty little uh, little feature for, for the Delrin products here. Uh, then we're just gonna kind of complete this off by adding another one of these spacers and another short thing. Uh, speaking of actually drivetrains, one of the other ones is we just got done with, uh, their, the, the MTI just got finished and there were some really, really cool uh, really, really cool drivetrains that saw there. There was like a really innovative, I don't remember if it was brain, I think it was one of the brain stem teams had uh, these pods that you can kind of drop out. So uh, what I'm kind of curious about is like, what types of things do, do teams, other teams do for serviceability? Uh, we can kind of talk about some of the things here with this with, with this drivetrain for the serviceability side. But uh, you know, when, when you're kind of going ahead and building your, your machine, what you do. Uh, so anyway, so the double one is done. We can now finally, Get to our last one which is our driven wheel so since this is a driven since this is a an omni drive and we're using the ultra planetary gearbox uh, it has a female hex output so you can shove the you can put the shaft into the into the female output 
uh, and you can use any shaft of any length. So it works really well when you want to do something like this as well, especially as when you have a well-supported shaft. So with this one, we're going to be using our, our Omni wheel on the back uh, for, this, for this build. Um, you can reorganize and, and put, your, uh, put your wheels kind of where you want them. If, if you wanted to move the Omni uh, away from the back of the drivetrain towards the front, you could do that if you wanted to. You could switch into two Omnis if you would like as well. And so there are some other options that are available. And then what we're going to use is something that I think is really kind of clever uh, that one of our mechanical engineers put in here uh, is doubling up on these uh, through bore uh, short space, the, the short bearings, the through bore short size bearings. Uh, basically, it makes it where the face of this is going to run, is going to kind of run on this on the other side of the seat where the channel is, uh, making it where it helps to add some extra constraint, which is really nice. Um, so anyway, so we kind of get this done. We put on the rest of the wheel. We got on our little through bore pieces here, and now we're going to want to add on another one of our little three millimeter spacers. Uh, so I want to take a question from a chat here that came in from Texas Diaz. Uh, says, are there any tips for working with putting spacers and through bore bearings on axles? I find I hurt my hand a lot trying to push them on. Yeah, so so that's actually one thing is the the bearings themselves um, are are very very uh, snug, uh, and they're kind of designed that way to be able to sit on the shaft really well. Um, one of the things that I I kind of like to do with with some of the bearing pieces is you can use um, you can use the end of the five millimeter hex uh, of your like or your five millimeter driver um, to kind of help press it down, especially when you have something like a shaft collar or something larger that you're able to hold on to. Um, that's the other end. You can kind of be able to get that extra leverage to be able to push things on. Um, the spacers tend, the, the spacers, uh, the three millimeter and the 1.5 millimeter tend to fit a little bit more smoothly. Um, the 15s, because of the taper, um, on one of the ends, they, they can tend to be a little bit tight. So my recommendation on some of those is you just kind of flip them around and you put it in through the other direction uh, can kind of help to save your hands and your fingers a little bit. Um, while you're doing some of these assemblies. Uh, one of the other things that's actually kind of clever about this is one of the, one uh, with the female hex on your uh, output for the ultra planetary is it does have a set screw to hold the shaft in place. One thing that you can do to kind of get around that is when you're doing some other ver ways of doing constraint. So if you're using the back basically of the gear, the output itself as one end of constraint, and you're using another shaft collar on a double supported, uh, two sides of the, the shaft itself are physically supported. You're able to kind of put another shaft collar in the middle, which is what we're doing with this driven shaft to be able to fully constrain that and make it where it's not going to pop out of your, uh, out of the, out of your motor, which is kind of, which is one of the night, one of the nice things, especially when you're trying to build with, some of the channels. So this is one. This is one kind of little technique uh, that that I'm, I I really think is very very clever, and it makes it easy easy for you to maintain as well. Um, another little maintenance tip. It always drove me nuts when kids on like students on the team, and even when I did this when I was on on a team, you would you'd have your shaft collars where you don't have them accessible, um, where the set screws aren't accessible both by the same thing. So trying to line those up while you're building these things um, can be helpful down the road. Uh, you know, save future you problems. Um, future Mac will will definitely appreciate this when they're, we're trying to take this apart maybe later to be able to switch off for a different wheel set or being able to do maybe a mechanic drive or something along those lines. Um, yeah, so we put this on here and then there's just a there's a big spacer stack that we need to put on. We basically need nine millimeters worth of spacers. Um, the other kind of clever thing you can do too is if you're running out of one type of spacer, um, they're 15 millimeters, three millimeters, and 1.5. You can stack a couple of one or the other to be able to get them in, in, to the correct, uh, the correct length that you need for your assembly. So we're going to put on all that that, that spacer stack, uh, and then we need to get our last through bore there. All right. Oops. Yeah, as as I think. Uh, Texas Diaz was pointing out like right here, like this is the very, very snug kind of fit here with with our with the with the bearings themselves. So with this, the 
um, the bearing itself is, is all seated in and we're kind of good to go. So that, that finishes off that chunk of the build. Um, some of the other things that are really nifty about the FTC starter kit is we have our ultra planetary motors. Um, so the cool thing is that you're able to swap out for those that don't know, you're able to take these cartridges and you're able to swap them out for one for another. Uh, the ultra planetary gearbox kit comes with the four, five and three to one uh, options that are available for you. Uh, for what we recommend for a drivetrain application is probably using something that is like our nominal 20 to one, which if I'm remembering correctly is somewhere in like the, somewhere in the 18 to one ish range is like 18 to 19 to one is like a true gear ratio. If you're really looking to get into your, uh, into your calcs, your calculations to be extremely precise, it's, it's somewhere in there. It's actually in our documentation, the exact, um, but it's pretty easy to put together. So this one, I pre-assembled this motor to make it a little bit faster for us to get this build together. But I have a couple of the spare uh, cartridges. So basically the two cartridges, you more or less are able to twist and seat these together. They kind of snap in place. And then you're able to just cinch in your, uh, your, uh, your hardware that comes with the kit uh, for both the, the one stage, zero, uh, zero stage, one stage, two stage, and three stage versions of this. So it's really, really kind of easy and you're able to customize on the fly to be able to get whatever speed you're, you're really looking for, your torque value, you know, uh, being able to make the most out of your motors. Yeah. So with that, we already have the ultra planetary put together. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna move on to actually getting this onto the channel. So our uh, channel here, we have, we're gonna be using the C channel because that's what we have inside of our starter kit V3. It has our extended motion pattern um, on there. Uh, which has, uh, it's very, very similar to the one that is the motion pattern that is on all of our motion brackets. So it is a uh, eight millimeter pitch. So it matches all of our brackets. Um, it has the nine millimeter bearing seat that is repeated every 16 millimeters down, uh, down our extrusion uh, or, down, or down the channel itself. and gives you ample opportunity for mounting points. Um, so what we're gonna do here though, is we're gonna kind of start by getting this motor put in on the fourth uh, point down. Um, one of the questions that we had that looks like it came in from chat is what does true gear ratio mean? And that is actually a really good question. So with planetary gearboxes, um, there are only a certain set number of basically the actual ratio that you're going to get. So when we were designing uh, the gearbox itself, you're shooting for a specific um, a specific gear ratio that you want to try to get, get towards. Um, but you're not going to be able to get that exact ratio. So it's the reason why like a lot of 20 to one planetary gearboxes that are not the ultra planetary, the ones that are not customizable, even the one that we sell here at Rev um, are actually somewhere around like a 19.1 to one ratio. Um, but Colloquially anomaly, they're a 20 to one ratio. Everyone refers to them as a 20 to one ratio. It's just, it's easier from a marketing side to be able to say what this is. And for the most part within competitive robotics, it's within the fudge factor of a lot of other things that you're doing um, that it, it doesn't, it kind of all works itself out in the wash, if that what, is that what it means. Um, so with, with the ultra planetary is not, is no exception. Uh, with some of the basically the differences between the ring gear and the sun and planet gears that are on the interior of the gearbox itself. Uh, there, there are some, uh, there are going to be some differences that are not going to be quite, uh, quite exact to, you know, it's not going to be exactly a five to one. It's not going to be exactly a four to one. So if you're looking for those exact measurements, uh, you might, you might need something a little bit different. Um, so it's something you can, you should be aware of when you're kind of putting together, uh, especially like encoder ticks is kind of the one big one that you should be aware of it in. But when it comes to most mechanism design, uh, you're able, you're able to get kind of close enough. Uh, it'll be, it'll be good enough for, uh, for most competitive robotics programs. Uh, but here, what we're doing is we're going to go ahead and we're trying to mount on our uh, ultra planetary here. So uh, let's see if I'm able to get this in shot. So there, there's a couple of these holes that we're able to pick up in the slots. Uh, to be able to use this uh, face mounting ultra planetary bracket. Uh, one of the things that we actually have from teams that we're asking, I uh, had, had a team on the phone today that said, you know, we have an old kit we're looking at. We want, we're looking at using your channel um, and we want to use this drivetrain, but we don't know if we're going to be able to do um, 
I don't know if we're going to be able to do uh, getting the ultraplanetaries and some of these other things, but we do have some of your 40 to 1 spur motors. Um, so we do actually have a uh, spacer that does that basically performs the same function as this this uh, bracket. Uh, so you're able to face mount a uh, you can face mount a, a, a an alt or a spur gearbox or the planetary gearbox directly to our uh, to our channel to that pattern. And you can also do it on any of the motion brackets. So there's some there's some things that are kind of useful that it can come come in some use there. Um, so we kind of have this already put in here. It's, we have it in a fourth hole down, um, which is where we kind of wanted to run for the. Uh, for the for the, the number of links that we've kind of assembled here, um, what I kind of like to do is I like to use the nut driver on the actual on the actual lock nut because you can get a little bit more bite with it, and then use a wrench on the bottom of the bracket. Um, also, typically, once you kind of get them finger started, you can kind of just cinch them down uh, one at a time in a, in a in a clockwise fashion. Um, I know some other folks are really, really big on doing uh, similar to what you would do with like a car tire where it's more of a uh, an X or a diagonal to kind of uh, go across to be able to make sure things are tight. But you know, some most of that's just personal preference. Um, but anyway, so we get this thing mounted and up on here. We'll be good to go. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so we continue to kind of move forward. Um, so with that, now that now that this uh, motor is kind of mounted on here, the next thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to add on our uh, end caps, our U-channel end caps. Um, so the cool thing with these is you're able to take them and you're able to put them into a piece of U-channel, which I just so happen to have here, and put it at the end to add some additional rigidity. Um, so if you wanted to take a look at that there. Um, it also gives you another place that you're able to mount from. Um, but the nice thing with the C channel is you're able to take it and you're able to use it to hold two pieces of C channel together um, to kind of do a uh, makeshift version of like a, a chain and tube kind of drive train. So that's kind of what we were uh, kind of what we were going for here. When you're utilizing these, uh, what I tend to like to do is start the middle uh, hole first uh, because like on the ends of these. Uh, on the end here of the channel. You can see how there's a center hole is, is not slotted unlike the other two. So it just makes it a little bit easier for you to get something with a little bit of a, you kind of get that fed in there and then you can tighten up the rest of them as you're kind of going. Uh, so there, there's a follow-up that looks like on the, on the true gear ratio question. So uh, with, is it only for planetary gearboxes or does this follow? With spur gearboxes, do they also have that difference? So for the most part, this is actually going to depend on the manufacturer. But for I, I believe I would need to double check on this, but I believe for both the 40 to 1 and 20 to 1 spur gearboxes, um, those are actually exact. They are 40 to 1 and 20 to 1, or they're pretty darn close. Um, the one thing that you're able to kind of do with a spur gearbox is a spur gearbox is much more similar to um, what you would what you would see normally from you know like using our Delrin gears or some of the metal gears that we have um, or uh, you know a, a gearbox that most competitive robotics teams would be more familiar with building themselves um, you're able to have a little bit more fine control on the compound gearing that you're doing there to be able to get the right tooth counts um, to get everything kind of squared away so once you kind of get these end caps on here we're able to kind of go from there One of the other things that we kind of have done a little bit beforehand is we've uh, uh, have already broken our chain. One of the other nice things actually is once you kind of get one of these end caps on, you're able to set it up this way and you can just kind of drill down onto it. You don't need to hold on to something a little bit more uh, more awkwardly, which makes this a little bit easier. Uh, but what I was saying is that we added uh, one of the one of the big pieces of feedback that we got from teams is uh, we released a chain tool actually uh, I think last year or the year before that it's it's been a, it's been out for a little while um, but we improved it to be able to also do 25 uh, H chain which is a little bit more of a heavy duty a little bit heavier duty chain for 
high level applications. Typically that's mainly used within um, larger scale robots like you would find within the first robotics competition. Um, you could find maybe a use for it for FTC, but you know, 42 pounds, usually not, uh, that 42 pound limit usually makes it where you kind of don't really need it in most situations. Um, but anyway, we ended up adding that uh, chain tool into the starter kit to make it even easier for teams to be able to utilize and manipulate chain. Um, because, you know, one of the things here at RAV that we kind of take a lot of pride in and also like to look at is we're, we're, we're huge supporters of, not a, of a lot of FIRST programs, including FIRST Global. And uh, we're, we're finding that, you know, it's hard to find tools to be able to break chain that's not provided to you if it's not from, like you can break it with a Dremel, you can break it in some other ways and you can utilize master links. Um, but having a dedicated tool for it is a lot more easy. It's a lot easier. Uh, and it, it just overall gives a better experience to students. So it's one of the cool minor, it seems like a really minor update, upgrade, um, but it's gonna be a huge quality of life improvement for a lot of teams. So anywho, we have this kind of set up. The next step that we need to do is we need to put on our uh, shafts themselves. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start um, by doing our double, by doing our double, and then we'll go ahead and do the single. Um, so with this, we want to go ahead and remove, um, we want to go ahead and remove our, our, uh, our shaft collar off the end um, and then put this kind of where it needs to go. So it's in the 14th hole in, and then we can put our shaft collar back on here and kind of hold this down. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like another question that we have from chat is, uh, this drivetrain is only two motors. Why would you not go with four? for the drivetrain. So with the FTC starter kit, kind of the way that it is generally designed from a design philosophy on what is available in the kit um, is we have a, uh, a kind of a goal internally to be able to have teams build a fairly successful robot in their first and second years completely out of the kit with minimal need to add additional items. So with that in mind, um, we have two of our HD hex motors are in the kit. Uh, there's a number of servos, I think it's four or five or six, it's somewhere in that ballpark, there's a number of servos that are in the kit. And then the other two DC motors are our core hex motor. Uh, the core hex motor is a great little motor. Uh, we do get uh, some interesting use cases that folks have been able to put it to use, but it's typically best to be used for an actuator um, and not into a drivetrain. So you tend to want to be using uh, brushed 550 class motors like the HD hex motor um, on your drivetrain and then using uh, your core hex motors in some other situations. Um, so putting on the double and the single sprocket is actually really, really similar. You just kind of find the, find the location it's in, you remove the shaft collar, you seat the bearing in and kind of go from there. Um, one of the things that you can kind of do with, well, with the secondary one, obviously we put a wheel on here. So we need to take that whole wheel assembly off uh, before we can kind of continue to move forward. So with this is pretty straightforward. We're just going to remove this. We're going to remove the wheel. And we also want to remove one of these two bearings before we kind of continue. And we can kind of take this and put this in, and then we're kind of good to go there. Um, Next thing that we're going to want to do is get our tensioning bushings, which they seem to have migrated on me. Um, so while we're looking for those, okay, there, there we go. So this is also a kind of a new, a new little, a couple of new products that we have for um, for Rev. Uh, is our we have a series of different standoffs that are all at all M3 standoffs, and we also have this tensioning bushing. So you're able to use our 40 millimeter um, M3 standoff with these tensioning bushings to provide the additional basically tension and take out the slack that is going to be in um, in chain runs and also potentially in belt runs as well. Um, depending on what the, what the actual center to center distance is. So one of the things that's kind of new, new to Rev is we've had an extrusion based system, which is not a fixed pitch system. So for you to be able to, um, it makes it a lot easier for you to be able to just kind of slide uh, things down, a, down uh, the extrusion channel itself, the slot and the extrusion to tighten 
uh, take out slack out of chain, take it out of belts, take it out of a lot of items. Um, with a fixed pitch system, you really can't do that. You need to be able to add tension in some other ways. So it's part of the reason why there are slots on a lot of, on there, there, there are slotted portions on the channel face itself is for you to be able to have that variability to be able to add a little bit of tension in when you're doing channel or chain runs or, or um, belt runs on the interior of your channel itself. Um, so, but with that, what we're gonna wanna do is start placing these guys on here. We have some suggested locations for these uh, that are that are inside of the guide itself. Um, you don't inherently have to, you don't inherently have to put them in these locations. You can find some other ones that might work a little bit better for your team. Um, depending on a couple of different factors. We tend to find that these ones work really, really well though. Um, so the other nice thing with these M3 standoffs is they are tapped. So you can just twist them on by hand and get them into the position that you need them to be in. Um, and we can go ahead and then do the same thing with the rest of these locations here, kind of on down our channel. Okay. Now, as we're kind of doing this, I mentioned this earlier, but you're gonna to need to keep in mind that all this stuff is actually duplicated because you're gonna do this for the other side of the robot kind of as well. Uh, actually, we have a really good question here in chat. Um, is there an easy way to create a six wheel drive with a center dropping wheel? Um, so there are a couple of different ways that you can kind of do that. Uh, if you wanted to do a drop center, uh, one way uh, is to use the, is if you're actually utilizing our, our extrusion or the channel profile, um, we, you can, you can kind of use those. Um, and you can kind of find, you can find a way of being able to put them in. We have an, a, an adjustable motion bracket that you're able to adjust um, to kind of be able to get that, that, that drop center. Um, you can also put uh, spacers or washers underneath a pillow block or something along those lines to be able to generate, you know, that, that little bit of a drop center. But quite honestly, within a six wheel drive um, setup, uh, what, what we've kind of seen is that it, it's actually beneficial to have, to not have the drop, especially within a lot of the games recently for FTC, where a number of them are like pick and place and stack games, is that that, that change in your center of gravity can kind of make your robot do like one of these little shimmy dances and uh, you know, it, it makes it a little bit less maneuverable or not maneuverable is a wrong word. It makes it a little bit less controllable um, depending on how much of a drop you have. Uh, one of the ways that we get around this, uh, especially with a lot of our six wheel drives is by adding um, Omni wheels in locations. So you can get better results with like a flat drive train with some Omni wheels on either end, um, or you can do them on both as well to get that extra maneuverability. And then you don't have a lot of that um, scrub happening from, from being able to move from side to side. Uh, but that is, that is a really, really good, uh, good uh, portion there. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna put this guy here as we kind of keep moving along. But yeah, the, the number of, the number of uh, six wheel drive, uh, 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 the number of six wheel drive, uh, 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 options that are available to you. You can kind of, you kind of mix and match to some degree. Um, but personally, I, I, I personally prefer having the Omni, especially after I used to be a, a pure purist on the drop center and then um, have seen some of the, some of the cool Omni, Omni drives that have been able to come out and um, have kind of been converted to that uh, methodology. Um, So uh, one of the other things kind of with, uh, you'll notice like with this kind of drive shaft as I'm entering it in and inserting it in is uh, you need to kind of come back and push the bearing to seat it completely into the channel here uh, to make sure that everything is kind of all set up. Cause the stack, the stack up when you're kind of doing the assembly for this one in particular, it is set up, um, is, is kind of set up with the, um, without having the channel in the way. So you, the distances can be can be just a hair off by a couple of millimeters here or there. Um, but anyway, once you get to this part, um, it's time for you to kind of put on your chain. So we've pre-broken some of the chain runs for this. Um, they're 56, uh, 56 link uh, loops. The way that I kind of tend to like to do this is, we're gonna leave that guy in there, is we kind of take this over the, over the center one, 
make sure to put this on the interior of this without dropping the tensioning bushing on. And then you kind of lead this um, all the way over to the correct one. So I actually put this on backwards this time. But if you kind of take this and shimmy that over, and then you can kind of take this up here and get the chain to kind of mesh on a little bit better. Uh, there we go. So then this way you're able to kind of get this up and over and setting it on. Getting it set on this middle one is usually the more difficult aspect of this. So you can kind of get that, get it started on one. Now, once you get to a position like this, you see kind of how this is a little bit craned over here. It's a little bit uh, cattywampus. What you can do is you can just take your driver and just kind of keep this cranking through and then it will seat on there really nice um, for you. So you can just kind of go ahead and we'll repeat that for the for the second, second one here. Um, Uh, one of the questions that seems like came through chat is, do we sell the rev stickers? Um, that is actually one of the more frequent questions. You, you wouldn't believe uh, how frequently we get asked that. Our uh, graphic designer, uh, Lauren, takes really, really great pride in her work and what she puts together for those. Um, it's one of our favorite things to be able to get the feedback from the community on how much they like the stickers. Um, if, but if you actually want some of our stickers, we don't sell them. Um, you can meet us at an event, come to our booth, and we'll be there. Uh, if you have a, uh, this year's maybe a little bit different, but in the past, like for FTC kickoffs, if you've reached out to us, we've been, we've tried to put together little care packages to set out to send out the different FTC kickoffs. Um, but lastly, if you happen to place an order uh, and you put something in the comments that you like some stickers or 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 some some other swag, uh, take a chance. You you never know what you might end up having in your box outside of just uh, just things that you happen to pick up. Um, you, you, you never, you never know. Um, so anyway, so we have this on here. Now is a good time for you to kind of take the tensioning bushings and we can kind of drop those on as well. Um, to be able to get those up and running. And then we just have to put our other half of the channel on here. So with this, you just want to make sure that you're able to get everything kind of made it on here properly. Make sure that all the bearings are going to seat properly. And then you're going to kind of hear that kind of a, a snapping noise to this. Um, and then from here, I tend to like to put the exterior portions of the rail on first and then work our way towards the center. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do that right now. I'm actually getting a, a notice. One of the things like where this is kind of going back a little bit, but uh, was with the uh, 18.9 to 1, for example, with the with the 20 to 1 gearboxes is with the planetary gearboxes. Uh, I, I have one. I have one of our MEs. Looks like he's in the chat. Is saying uh, for the for the longest life of your gears, uh, you want them to be co-prime with one another. So it ends up, um, and you also want to minimize and maximize the given number of teeth for a particular gear. So it leaves you with some odd gear ratios that are not, um, you know, not typical or not. Uh, Typical is the wrong term, but not uh, not quite even from like a twenty to one, thirty to uh, twenty one, thirty one, forty one type of a type of a situation. So anyway, so we're gonna get this guy in here. So one of the one of the big questions that we kind of have gotten from um, some folks, at least initially, has been around. Um, maintenance for this drivetrain you know it, it we get questions that are like well you're it uses delrin um you're using the del the delrin bearings how frequently do we need to be checking on those you know you're using delrin sprockets how frequently do we need to be checking on those um and typically we say like probably about once a competition like probably do a pre and post um before your event and kind of do a visual inspection of both of, of both of them um, to make sure that everything is uh operating uh normally uh, so we're just going to continue to populate these, these screws in here. We'll get this guy in here. So you can kind of go ahead and do that. One of the things that's really kind of nice about this um, drivetrain is to take the wheels, basically taking the wheels off, getting everything kind of up and running. It doesn't really take you that long to uh, to be able to do those types of maintenance checks. Um, you're able to kind of confirm and tighten things down and get things ready to go um, one way or another. So 
Let's get that kind of section there. Can we go from there? Um, and uh, this kind of goes back to another question that was was had earlier. Uh, was around like the why why do you guys only use, only using it with the two motors? Um, we actually do have some variants that if we have a little bit of time, hopefully I'll be able to show you guys. Um, that are available that have uh, that have multiple that actually have multiple motor that have multiple motors they have multiple um, different wheel configurations that type of that type of a thing as well. So anyway, we're just going to finish kind of putting up these tensioners. The the one thing that I kind of like to do with these is you tight is you kind of tighten them down um, a little bit a little bit too much, and then you can kind of adjust and, and back off. From the from the too high point, um, for some of these you may want to um, for some of these you you, you you may want you may want to kind of do uh, a little bit of a little bit of a run with either either the either the nut driver itself that comes with your kit or you know you want to use uh, a, you know a, bat, a battery off of the off the motor itself to be able to give it a little bit of run give it a little bit of a run kind of see uh, if it, it kind of sounds good if it's not there's nothing there's nothing grinding there's enough you have enough chain wrap that's occurring on uh occurring on your sprockets etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're gonna go ahead and clean that off get that all done and uh all right so with that we kind of have this this one is kind of uh almost on the way there um yeah and uh we're gonna continue to kind of move forward from there we got the chain in there um, feel free to keep posting comments in the chat. Um, if you guys have any questions, we're more than happy to kind of uh, chime in and answer them as we're kind of going through the rest of this build. Um, this actually leads, leads us to kind of part of our final assembly here. Um, one of the one of the big tips and tricks that we kind of give to folks a lot of times is with our brackets um, is preloading them as much as you can. So you make sure that you put uh, we we do stud up building. So there's ribs on our uh, brackets themselves you kind of put your uh, m3 hardware in there finger tighten them down with your your uh your lock nuts on the end um it just makes it a little bit easier for you to be able to put these on um what we're going to do is the back of this drivetrain has a piece of extrusion um that kind of, that has two pieces of extrusion that help to uh help to kind of add a little bit more rigidity to the system so we're going to go ahead and get these brackets up in here so that we're able to get that all settled in. Um, so with these, you might need to adjust them a little bit later. So what we like to do is, you know, you just kind of get these a little bit, a little bit tight. You don't really need to nail them. You don't really need to get them down in there uh, as tight as you need them to be, because you can kind of, you can utilize these extrusion slots the same way that you would on a regular extrusion. You can kind of adjust it as you kind of as you're going. Um, so we're going to just continue to put these on for the rest of these sides here. Flip this over. Um, yeah, I'll keep going here. Uh, we're going to kind of keep, keep going here as we're getting these 90 degree brackets kind of put in um, into the system here. Um, so there are uh, Look at these other two over here as well. So one of the one of the questions it looks like that we got in chat is uh, maybe a question for later. But do you have any adapters or brackets for commonly mating C channel with the 15 millimeter extrusion itself? So. It's a really good question. Um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but all of our brackets will work with both the channel and the extrusion system. So not just through the slots on the top, but our brackets do have an eight millimeter pitch. So you will be able to find holes on the pattern itself to be able to pick those up. So if you have like, for example, a lap corner or an inside corner bracket, you'll be able to find a hole somewhere in the system that you're able to kind of connect an extrusion to. Um, the U and the C channel, um, themselves also have a few other nifty features where if you can actually uh, connect the through the ends of the extrusions. This is one of the one of the you kind of connect in through one of these ends, um, either here or through the center hole. 
um, and, and connect it directly in and then also use a bracket um, if you have it aligned flush with the top or if you have it somewhere in the middle as use, utilizing it as a standoff. Um, so there are multiple opportunities since it's M3 hardware, still an eight millimeter pitch. There's a few holes that you're able to pick up um, pieces of pieces of the extrusion profile of the of the extrusion profile itself. Um, there's enough there's enough kind of uh, information there that you're able to do uh, a number a number of things there. Um, the the ninety degree the the ninety degree uh, brackets that go into the slot is one is is one way of doing it. Um, you could also use our uh, I'm I'm a personally personally I'm a big fan of the the fifteen millimeter high def or HD, uh, the HD corner bracket. It, it's, a, it's a cute little guy. Uh, I, I personally really like using that one. Um, so the last kind of step that we have here is we need to go ahead and um, add on a couple of brackets here. So we have we have uh, set a C channel that is also going to run in between that's going to kind of bridge these. So we're going to kind of take these channel pieces and run these down here and kind of get them aligned. So we designed this channel, this chassis. So this is this is actually a pretty uh, question I'd actually have for chat. So we have this internal debate here on Reb on do you do open front, open back? Do you do both sides open? Uh, do you do a complete closed chassis and then you do everything over the frame to be able to manipulate game pieces? You know, what's the preferred way that you guys like building? Do you like building with, uh, you know, having it where there's an opening where it makes it easier for you to be able to get. Um, get a game piece connected or you're looking for something that's a little bit more rigid in style uh, it's kind of a kind of a difference of opinion so this one we're going to build as a as an open front here uh, by doing this this way and we're just going to kind of adjust this we can kind of adjust this a little bit as we kind of go um, so we're going to get those finished up here and we'll take this piece here uh, and we're going to move this guy onto our piece here so this is going to give a, a good amount of space um, in the front of the robot where you can kind of make some of the adjustments uh, for for like an intake or a game piece on that on that level. Um, you don't inherently have to be stuck um, using uh, using using some mechanism that goes over the front uh, of the robot and it makes it makes that a little bit easier. Um, so we end up having this this one whole side is basically done at this point. So you you need to end up having a second side um, already ready uh, to rock and roll, uh, which I do, and I seem to have put this one. I need to do this, and I'm going to need to. So they actually mirror each other, um, which is kind of the nice thing. And so then we can kind of take these guys and just slide them together, and then finish connecting them. Um, one of the things that you're going to want to make sure to do is that you're kind of aligning this up um, in a way in which the the, the two sides themselves um, need to be more or less in line with each other. If you kind of don't, you're going to run you're going to run into um, some some issues there. Um, so I'm going to kind of go here, put this together. Speaking of, uh, these are the little guys. I'll actually show you guys those in just a second here once we get this done. So this side, we already have the wheels on. Um, so I mentioned that at the, at the early onset, that the last piece of this is actually just kind of sliding these pieces of extrusion in here, which I have lost. Uh, there it is. I lost one of these brackets. Um, so one of the downsides is, is I did not actually tighten this on when I was assembling this the first time. Good thing that these slots are really, really easy to be able to get them kind of on. You can kind of keep these relatively loose uh, and being able to do your kind of loosen them up, kind of get them more or less aligned with each other so that it makes it a little bit easier to slide your extrusion on through. You do that to the one side, do it to the other side. And we can kind of be. Get this thing lifted up here. Um, so one thing that you might need to do is we're having a little bit of a conflict here where the extrusion is running against the end of the channel profile. So you can kind of slide these things out to be able to make make a little bit more room uh, to kind of get that that started. 
one uh, one little trick that I kind of like to do when you're aligning these is if you actually take when you're doing the build section of it, if you actually take one of the uh, pieces of extrusion itself and kind of help to line it up before you kind of get started, it can make it a little bit easier to have them in the correct spot. So this last step is really, really straightforward. So, Mike, while you're finishing up on here, uh, if people want to learn uh, more about uh, this build or, or get some good resources and materials, where can they go on the Rev Robotics website for that? Yeah, so actually, if you're looking for some good materials, so with this, this guy is actually almost pretty much done. Um, all, we, all we really have to do is go ahead and put on the back and then add the wheels on the other side. Um, you end up getting a finished robot, which would look uh, something kind of like this guy down here. You have a finished robot that would look like this. Um, so we have put on a little bit of a, a little bit of a quick electronics pad here, which has our has the control hub on it, as well as um, an expansion hub. You kind of can see the the wiring that we end up having kind of running running down here through the bottom, uh, making that pretty pretty a straightforward process. But you're going to end up with a pretty sturdy uh, chassis here. If you're looking for information on this drivetrain or on uh, drivetrains like it or other resources. Uh, RevRobotics.com forward slash resources, our current home for our technical resources. Um, one of the things that actually I would kind of, since we do have a little bit of time, um, one of the things that we have been working on uh, has been our uh, transition into a new, uh, a new world of documentation. So being able to have a fully online uh, system that we can end up putting build guides up, we're able to put more information uh, a little bit faster, being able to get feedback to the community, troubleshooting guides and the like can all get placed on here. Um, we're kind of taking a little bit of a whirl through some of our um, the hardware side, but we also have it also for the software side with our control system. So, you know, we have like our getting started for the control hub, which, you know, is going to be a really big thing this year with a number of team with the with the number of teams being able to switch over. So being able to walk through all these processes in one place uh, really is going to not just help you know, rookie teams, but it'll also help the veterans. But if you head to revrobotics.com forward slash resources, we'll have a number of those things. Um, another one of the questions that we actually tend to get is, and this was kind of alluded to by another uh, person in chat, is, you know, how you're able to upgrade the kit. So we actually have, so here's a version that's running uh, a Mechanum drive. Uh, we end up having four motors are set up on here. So these bottom ones are, uh, the wheels are direct driven. The tops here, we actually have these are running off of our belts. Um, so if you wanted to upgrade to a belt driven system versus a chain driven system, this is actually a perfect center to center. So you no longer need to use any of the tensioning. Um, it's running a, what is this? It's a 120, I think 120 tooth uh, belt uh, running with our 24 tooth, uh, our 24 tooth uh, uh, pulleys that are in here. Uh, you can easily use this even with a six wheel drive uh, a six wheel drive version. Uh, one of the, one of the other things is we get questions about the Del, about the Delrin, uh, about our, about the Del, Delrin, uh, bearings themselves. And if you should, when you should switch over to different types, we do have a, what we call our bearing block. Um, so this is, you can kind of see that in the upper corner. Um, it's a five millimeter hex bearing block. You can kind of put that anywhere on the channel as well. Um, makes that a really, really easy, um, a really kind of easy upgrade being able to switch over to these and they, they spin real nice as well. Um, we have, an, and there's a number of other things that you're able to do as well. Uh, you know, you can switch to, switching to the multiple motors would probably be the first step for most teams. Um, then probably switching over to the mechanum wheels and, may, and maybe adding bearing blocks and the belts after that. Um, one of the questions that we have in chat is actually around a build for this guy. So we're actually going through and we're uh, working on that actually currently, it's one of the it's one of the next things that we're we're hoping to have that available and ready for this season. So we'll have a full list of available materials um, as well as some of our testing data. I will say uh, this thing this thing books it. Uh, it was it was chasing around. Uh, we had it driving around earlier today. Uh, it is a it is a it's a fun little robot. But uh, but yeah, so that's some of the new stuff that we have uh, this year coming to the to coming to the starter kit and for a number a number of teams. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, really appreciate answering all of them in chat, but don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can call us or, or reach out to us via email support at revrobotics.com. We try to answer our email as fast as we can. 
um, and get the, get you the correct inf information and get you set up and uh, ready to ready to rock rock and roll. So a uh, couple of things to, to wrap up with this, Mike. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to go through this as well. Uh, if we're talking FPC in particular, is there, any, is there anything else that you guys on Reb, uh I don't know if you can spoil anything maybe he's coming for uh, next season, but is there anything you're like, hey, like, uh, in my opinion, every Reb or every FTC team should be using something like this because it's really going to make a big difference on their robots. So, so the one thing that I, I, I cannot advocate enough is that I think the more teams that we have that adopt the control hub, uh, the better competition experience we're going to have for all teams. Um, there are a number of things technologically that you're able to do with having a close, a little bit more of a closed system and a little bit more control over that system. It's a completely custom controller built for competitive robots in both the classroom and on the field for matches. So it gives us a lot more flexibility uh, to be able to do a lot of these updates. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of like real technical things we can get into, like there's beacon rates and all this other stuff that will improve Wi-Fi environments, the connectivity, but the overall experience is just going to be so much better. One of the things, like I, I handle a lot of our customer support, and the number one issue that we have with folks with the expansion hub is it's, it's communication over USB, um, and just the fact a control hub alone eliminates that on top of a lot of the other improvements. Um, not only will it make it a better experience for you and your team, but it will also make it a better experience if you have the if you have the ability. Um, it will make it a better experience for the teams in your region, even if they're not using uh, the control hub. So it's it's it, it is it is a definitely a little bit of a shift and a little bit of an upgrade. And, a little, and there are some things that are different about it, right? Like there is no screen, so you know your your uh, workflow for like vision processing and things like that might might be a little bit different. Um, but that is actually the number one thing. Like we're, we're working on a number of improvements specifically for the control hub um, that we got as feedback from the beta, from the beta test. Um, and our software group is hard at work on that. Um, we're working on doing a, a better job with a lot of our documentation um, that was part of the documentation system changeover. Um, we're going to be adding more application examples, being able to add more feedback that we've gotten from teams. Um, New products this year. We're gonna kind of. We're still a little bit tight-lipped on what the new the new stuff is gonna be for this season. Um, but generally speaking, a thing that you can expect from Rev um, is every single year we're gonna keep getting more and more uh, information out to the uh, out to the public and out to our out to the teams uh, to be able to find ways that they're able to have a successful season. Um, there also might be a new dinosaur sticker uh, if you're really really <laughs> looking forward to that one. So. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.